Gospel of Matthew. I, I have absolutely loved going through and studying the life of, of Jesus. But one of the things that I've noticed throughout this Gospel is that this is a Gospel of the authority of God. And we see that repeated again and again. In fact, let's take that a step forward. forward. It is the authority of Jesus Christ. We see His authority in teaching. We see His authority in healing. We see His authority demonstrated in the forgiveness of sins. We see His authority over Satan. And now we see His delegated authority as He passes on that authority to His apostles. Matthew is a book that thoroughly demonstrates the authority of Jesus Christ. Well, at the There's only three of rows. this gospel here, we see Third that row. Jesus uses three. that authority that has been given from the Father to commission his disciples to be his representatives, to be his apostles. And that's where we pick it up today. Make no mistake about it at all. Matthew is a gospel of, of missionary faith. In fact, Christianity is, is a religion of, of missionary faith, as Christ commands us to go and take the good news of the gospel to the entire world. If you look in your Bibles, once again, the time of today is the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Verse 16 says this, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to a mountain which the Lord had appointed for them. Now, you might ask, why the eleven? Well, at this point, Judas has already committed suicide, and so where before they were referred to as the, the twelve, the disciples were, now they're being referred to as a whole, as, as the eleven. And so they're sent away to, to Galilee at this point. The Bible doesn't specify exactly which mountain it is, but apparently the disciples knew. Apparently those who were with them knew, because we see in verse 16 that it says the mountain to which the Lord appointed them to go. Some have speculated maybe it's Mount Tabor, and, and just outside of the Galilee area. Or others have speculated that maybe he sent them back to the, the Sermon of the Beatitudes, where Jesus had given them that sermon and they knew exactly where it was to, to meet them. But my question is, why Galilee? Why would Jesus send them from Jerusalem all the way back there? Well, for one thing, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, who had already committed suicide, every one of the disciples was from the region of Galilee. After the Feast of Passover was over, the logical place for them to go would be right back in their home territory, go, go right back into Galilee. But the Moody, uh, Moody Bible Commentary brings up a real interesting point. It says this, Galilee was considered the last stop in Israel before entering Gentile lands. It is significant that Jesus would give the Great Commission targeting all of the nations to his disciples here. So often with Jesus, he'll take you to a place, uh, Caesarea Philippi, for example, with the cliff in the background, uh, the God Pan up on the wall, and this, this Gentile area with the Jordan River. One of the tributaries is coming right out from underneath the rock to give a, a very important lesson. Here we've got Jesus telling his disciples to go back into the region of Galilee, uh, it, which is the, the furthest outreach before going to the Gentiles to say, okay, now I'm going to commission you. Up until this point, the ministry of the disciples had been to the, the Jews alone, but now they're <coughs> in the entire world. In fact, this is most likely the same appearance as recorded in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, where it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In other words, it's telling them now, it's not just a matter of going to the Jews. Now it's a matter of taking this gospel out to the entire world. R.C. Sproul says that if Jesus was not God incarnate, their act of worshiping him would have been the epitome of idolatry. They would have been worshiping the creature rather than the creator. But they readily worshipped him, and Jesus received their worship. Do you realize how significant that is? You see in other uh, passages, for instance, the Apostle John is given this incredible revelation from an angel, and as he is, he, he's just overcome, and he, he, he bows down, and the angel says, Stop! You need to get up! Worship God! And here we've got some of the disciples who are there with Jesus at this point, and as they see him resurrected from the dead, they begin to worship him. You don't hear Jesus say, get up, don't do that. Worship God. What do you hear? He receives their worship. You don't hear any rebuke at all from Jesus. That's absolutely significant in seeing who Jesus is. But the Bible also says that some doubt. You know, it's been that way for over 2,000 years, isn't it? Some come to, to church to worship Jesus. 
Others come to church and they doubt what it is that they're worshiping. They, they, they don't understand. We see that in, in both cases. But here, we've got to ask that question. Who's it talking about? Is this talking about the 11 disciples? Because if it's talking about the 11 disciples, seven days earlier, at least several days earlier, Jesus had made an appearance with them, with Thomas there, in which all of them were together. And finally, Thomas realized that it was Jesus and began to, to worship him. Well, perhaps what it's talking about, Paul makes a reference to Jesus appearing to over 500 witnesses. It is very possible that the 500 witnesses were here in Galilee on this mountain. Paul writes, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that He was seen, here's the, the visible presentations of Jesus and manifestations of Jesus, and that he was seen by Cephas, who of course is Peter, then the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at one time, some of whom the greater part remained to the present, some have fallen asleep. Now, when Paul brings up the 500 brethren, basically what he's saying, look, if you have any doubts at all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you go talk to these individuals because the majority of them are still alive, and they can give testimony to that which they have seen. But he also says, and some have fallen asleep. Isn't it interesting in the Bible that when the Bible talks about the death of a believer, it doesn't say they've gone to extinction. It doesn't say that the lights are, are, are out. What it says is that they're asleep. Why is that? Because the believer in Jesus Christ will always rise to him. Think of that next time you go to sleep dead tired at night. You're exhausted at the end of the day. You go to bed, crash, you're down, right? The next morning you, you get up, and it's almost as, as if you've been resurrected to, to new life. And that's the imagery that we see here, is that uh, some of the believers have gone to sleep. But it's possible that those who doubted were, were some of these 500. That was the, the timing. Because if you remember back in John chapter 20, verse 21, it says this, Thomas said, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails in my, and put my finger into the print of the nails, excuse me, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. What do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Because he had to see, he had to touch, he had to feel in order to believe. But once Thomas did, Thomas began to worship Christ. And he gives one of the strongest proclamations of worship that we find in the entire Bible. And from that point on, he is on fire for the Lord. He follows the Lord all the way to the point of his, his death. You know, and so once again, what we need to remember is that, that this incident that we're looking at here uh, happened days before the incident with Jesus in Galilee. This was back when, when they were in Jerusalem at this point. So at this point, I don't think the disciples were doubting. I think it was the other individuals who were with him. Verse 18, and Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, throughout Matthew's gospel, what we've seen, in fact, throughout all of the gospels, what we see is Jesus' favorite title for himself is the Son of Man. He's always called himself the Son of Man. So often we look at the title Son of God and we say, well, that's a proclamation of the deity of Jesus Christ. We look at the title Son of Man and we say, that's a proclamation of the humanity of Jesus Christ. I don't think so. I think the title Son of Man is very significant. Jesus used it 82 or 83 times. And when he does it that many times, he's communicating something to us. And what he was doing over and over again is relating that Son of Man back into the book of Daniel. In which Daniel talked about his heavenly being, the Messiah who was going to be coming. In fact, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, we see it says, And I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of God coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. That whole imagery of the cloud of heaven. How do we see Jesus when Jesus returns? He's returning on the clouds of heaven, isn't he? So we've got one like the Son of Man who's returning or coming here on the clouds of heaven. And he stands before the Ancient of Days, which is a picture of God the Father. And in verse 14, it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. In other words, the Ancient of Days gives all of this authority and power and might to the, the Son of Man, to Jesus Christ. And we see all of this coming together. He's been given that authority by the Father. Verse 19, now we see what we call the Great Commission. And Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Up until this point, the disciples had been told to, to go only to the, the lost sheep of Israel, to go out only to the Jews. But now, Jesus is expanding that. He's telling them to go and make disciples of all nations. But He's not just given this command to the, to the disciples or to the apostles, by the way. He's given that command to us as Christians. That all of us are to take that gospel. All of us are to go out and share the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Did you notice the four things that Jesus tells his disciples? He told them to go. They need to go. But this is in the present participle. In other words, what that means when, he, when, when, they, when they say go in this particular sense, literary style, what they're saying here is that you're already going. As you go, this is what you need to do. As you go, you need to go out, you need to baptize, and, and, and you need to, to teach, you need to do all of these things. We see in uh, John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said this. He said, as the Father sent me, I also send you. Now, what's important for us to realize is there's a difference between a disciple and an apostle. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's like being an apprentice or a student of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one who is sent. And so Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 21 says, As the Father sent me, I send you. In other words, Jesus is commissioning his disciples into being apostles. Now, if I were to ask you who is the greatest apostle, uh, you might say, oh, well, Peter was, Peter was a great star, or maybe John, or how about even the Apostle Paul? Who's the greatest apostle in the Bible? I would say go to John chapter 20, verse 21, and see what it says. Do you see what it says? As the Father has sent me, I also send you. What is an apostle? An apostle is one who is sent. Who is the greatest apostle, the apostle, in the entire Bible? It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And with the authority that he has, he turned around and he passed on that authority to you and me so that we can go out and that we can minister to the entire world and not just the Jews. When Jesus was on earth, a couple of times he went out of territory. He focused on the Jews as well. But you realize that he's left it to his bride, to the bride of Christ, to take the gospel to the entire world. That is the mission that we have. That is the standing orders for all Christians, that we're called to go out and minister and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And then secondly, he says, to make disciples. Now, this is the only one that's in the imperative. In other words, it's an absolute command. Make disciples. Everything else it, are, are verbs. In other words, it, it, you're going, you're, you're doing, you're teaching, you're doing all of these things. But we're commanded to make disciples. And once again, a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ, a student or an apprentice, if you would. But one thing that we need to realize is that we don't need to be super educated to make disciples of other people. In fact, we tend to think, well, it's the clergy or the, the elders and the deacons who are supposed to be going out and doing the discipling and all of these other things. But what Jesus tells us is that every believer is to go out and make disciples. So how can I do that? I'm not very educated. I, I, I don't feel like I'm skilled to go and do that. Do, do you realize that each and every person is at a different place spiritually? Each and every one of us are at a different level spiritually. Whatever we've received, we can turn around and we can pass that on to someone else. And say, well, how, how can I disciple my children? How about your grandchildren? Can you disciple them within the faith? How about reaching out to, to another brand new believer? It doesn't matter whether they're five years old or 85 years old. When they come to Christ, they're a brand new believer in Christ. And they need to be nurtured and they need to be built up. 
I think so often we make mistakes by, by thinking all we have to do is bring them to Christ and then we bring them to church and then they do everything else. But the world is pulling at them, trying to get them away. They're doing, the world's doing everything they can. I, I've heard over and over again people have said, well, I, I, I don't want to make my children come to church. I want them to decide on their own. Let's think about that for a moment. What do you think the world is going to teach them? Christianity? Get out of there. They're a bunch of fools. And if we leave our children to the world, that's going to be the pull that's upon it. We've got to set the foundation early. 85% of the people who come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior do so between the ages of 4 and 14. 4 and 14. In fact, by 18, it's just about done. And those are child evangelism fellowship statistics. But it's, uh, it's amazing. We've got an incredible opportunity to reach out and make disciples. And, and even if you're, you're discipling another adult, do you realize you don't have to have a set discipleship course? Share your life with them. Go have a cup of coffee with them. Talk about the circumstances of life and the hope that we have in Christ. And maybe how God has helped you. And we can disciple in those ways without being absolute Bible experts. <laughs> Jesus has called us to train up disciples so that they can reach others. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, a disciple is able to go out and win others and teach them. This was the pattern of the New Testament church. In many respects, we have departed from this pattern. In most churches, the congregation pays the pastor to preach, win the lost, and build up the saved. Well, the church members function as cheerleaders if they are enthusiastic or spectators. The converts are one, baptized, and given the right hand of fellowship, and then they join the other spectators. How much faster our churches would grow, and how much stronger and happier our church members would be if every one of them were discipling another believer? The only way a local church can be fruitful and multiply instead of growing by additions is with a systematic discipleship program. This is the responsibility of every believer and not just a small group who have been called to go. Each and every one of us are called in some way to be other disciple. Well, number three, we're to be baptizing. Baptizo is the Greek word that's used here, and what that word means is it means to, to dip, or it means to, to immerse. One of the things that's really troubling me today is I don't understand why more Christians won't be baptized. I mean, the baptisms that have just gone down, that hardly anyone sees the need to follow Christ in baptism. But in the Bible, what you see is an individual comes to Christ, and almost immediately they follow in baptism. You know, and, why is it that people don't want to be baptized today? Why is it that important to them? There's a picture that takes place. There's an identification just as if you're getting married. When my, my wife and I exchanged vows, we already had the love for each other. But we exchanged our rings and then it was sealed by, excuse me, we exchanged our vows and then it was sealed by the ring. And what the ring says is from this time forth, my love and my life. In baptism, we go ahead and there's, you stand in the water beforehand, and it's symbolic of your old sin nature before coming to Christ. You're lowered underneath the water, which is a picture of joining Jesus in his death and his burial. You're raised back up out of the water. It's a picture of your new life in Christ. It's a picture of being identified with him. And, and the promise that as surely as Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again, that you too will rise again in Jesus Christ. There's a beautiful picture that's, that's going there. But we also see here that, that the baptizing was to be done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that the word name is in the singular? Of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what we have here is we have a, a, doctor, a picture of the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus, many people have said, that, that Christians have just made up the Trinity. But what we see here is Jesus very clearly identifying the Trinity. I used to really struggle with that doctrine. In fact, I went to a pastor early on and said, I just don't get it, I don't understand it. And he said, well, maybe this illustration will help you. It's the whole concept of three in one. And he said, I want you to think for a minute of an egg. So I want you to imagine that I've got an egg in my hand. If I were to ask you, how many eggs do you see? What would you say? One egg. But if I were to take that egg and I were to crack it in a bowl, and drop it in, and then hold it up, what would you see in my hand? An egg shell. 
But what would be in the bowl? An egg white and an egg yolk. But are they all equally egg? Absolutely. What's the difference? The difference is in the roll. Can you imagine one without the other? You need the whole together to be one. Each of them are equally A, but they're with different functions. And that's how the Trinity is. God is one in essence, but three in persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet they're different in role. And so here you see Jesus is saying that you need to go out and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That word amen on there means it is true, or so be it. Well, the fourth step that we find is that of teaching. You know, people say, I can't teach. I, I don't know the Bible good enough. One of the remarkable things that I've learned over the years is when you really begin to grow, you want to know if you really want to grow spiritually, you want to know what it's going to be? It's going to be when you step forward in faith and you begin trying to teach someone else. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody has the spiritual gift of teaching, but even as you're teaching your children, even as you're working with other family members, even if you take this little small group Bible study and you take your turn in teaching, a remarkable thing happens because anything that's set the amount of time that you're talking, there is so much more studying that goes in that by the time that you're done and by the time you step forward in faith, the one who is the blessed the most out of the message in which you give is yourself because you really begin to learn. And anyone who's done teaching realizes that. They realize that as they step forward in faith, that's when they really <coughs> are blessed. But one of the sad things today is that there's so little solid biblical teaching in, in, in the church at large today. More and more people are getting away from the Bible. More and more people are getting into self-help. The power to change lives, ladies and gentlemen, is in the Word of God. And as you go through the Word of God, this Word of God will apply to your life in different ways than it applies to my life. But as you go to the Word of God, that's the power that God will work in you to transform your life into Christ's likeness. Look at the incredible promise that Jesus said in verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's Jesus saying? He's saying when you walk out there in faith, when you go, when, when you make disciples, when you baptize, when, when you teach, wherever you go, so long as you're doing it in my name, I will go with you. I will help you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. If you've never stepped forward in faith, you've never had the opportunity to experience that. I share so many times that teaching terrifies me. Or it doesn't so much now, but it absolutely terrified me when I started. But over the years, one of the things that I found out is if I did the study, if I went ahead and I stepped up in faith and I went ahead and started to teach, that the Lord would lead me there. And the longer that I did it, the more often I did it, the more confident I became that the Lord would meet me there. Maybe you have struggles in other areas of your life, but over the years you've learned that if you step forward in faith, that the Lord will meet you there. The Lord will help you to be able to get through those times and do things that you can never do on your own. But how does He do this? Well, we're promised that the Holy Spirit of God, the moment we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We understand that. We're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so often, what we end up missing is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that when you step forward to use your spiritual gifts, and by the way, if you're feeling frustrated in your faith, are you using those gifts that God has given to you for ministry? Because if you use those gifts, the Holy Spirit will empower you to be able to reach out and do things that you never, ever thought that you would be able to do. But it's important as we're studying through the, the Great Commission to see how it ties directly to Acts chapter 8, or excuse me, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 where it says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, the Holy Spirit not only regenerates us, the Holy Spirit empowers us to go out and minister. Wherever we go, He's with us because He indwells us. But there's a second aspect to this that we need to see as well. R.C. Sproul says this, he says, though He returned to heaven, he remained with them in a real sense. 
In regard to his human nature, Jesus is no longer present with us. The human nature, the glorified human nature of Jesus is in heaven. But he goes on and says, he is in heaven and at the right hand of God. But regarding his divine nature, which is perfectly united at every second to his, to his human nature, he is never absent from us. In other words, the two natures of Jesus that we talked about, that told Jesus is fully God and that he's fully man. In regards to his glorified human nature, Jesus ascended into heaven and he's still in that glorified human nature one place at one time. But in regard to his divine nature, that Jesus is fully God, he's everywhere at one time. Jesus Christ will never leave you. He'll never forsake you as you go out and faithfully follow him. We need to understand that the Great Commission is not a great suggestion. It's not a matter that Jesus is saying, look, you guys, I, I, I suggest you guys go up and start ministry. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. And the Great Commission, that word, once again, uh, to make disciples is an imperative. It is a command. You need to go and make disciples. That's why you're here on earth. You're here on earth to glorify God. You're here on earth to share the kingdom with other individuals. Came to our little community 19 and a half years ago. And I gotta tell you, I, I love this community. When you come here from the San Francisco Bay Area, the seven and a half million people they have there, all of the crime, congestion, all the things that are going, this, this is paradise that I'm walking in the And we moved into this area and, and, and we very quickly ended up falling in love with it. The Oregon coast is one of the most beautiful areas in the entire world. You realize people travel from all over the world to get here to see what we get to enjoy every single day. We are so blessed to live in this area. But looks can be deceiving because there's a, a lot of people here who are desperately in need of Jesus Christ. I was looking at some statistics this week. In fact, the first one that I got was a newsletter that came from the Women's Safety and Resource Center in Coos Bay. And it reported the statistics for the year 2015. This is what they said. 530 women, 650 children, and 117 male survivors of domestic and sexual violence and abuse sought help through their organization. Now, in our community, we've got 62 to 63,000 people in the entire county of Coos County. This means 530 women, 650 children, 117 male survivors were having, having trouble here with domestic and sexual violence and, and needed to seek organization, or needed to seek help from this organization. And then secondly, over 150 women and 80 children have stayed in their emergency shelters. I took it a little bit further and I was reading statistics from the 2015 Children First uh, for Oregon Report. And within that report, one of the things I found out is that drug use in Coos County is among the highest in the state of Oregon. In fact, you'll hear people quite often calling us the meth capital of the world because it's so easy to get meth here in the amount of meth that's, that's made right in this particular area. Surprisingly, as a result of that, child placement in the foster care in Coos County is, is also among the highest in the state. In fact, right now they're desperate for foster care workers that can come in and take the children because there are so many of them. 309 children so far in 2015 in our little community that have been put in the foster care, if you can imagine that. In the same report, it said that we've got 461 homeless students in Coos County. That blew my mind. I think we have 461 homeless students in Coos County. And another thing that blew my mind is that only 62%, I saw this in two different reports, only 62% of high school age children or, or young people actually go on and graduate. That means almost 50% don't graduate for one reason or another and see all of these issues that are happening within our community. Additionally, we recently heard reports on the news of Coos County being asked to put less people in the Oregon's prison system. Coos County is overwhelming the prison system within Oregon. You look at our beautiful community, you come here, everything's so peaceful and calm, but behind the scenes, there's a storm that's going on that we aren't even aware of, I don't think, unless you're really digging into that. 
But how many of you heard that report on the news that the judges had, had asked that Oregon back off because we're overwhelming <coughs> the, the, the prison system? And there's a couple of possibilities where that came from. Number one, maybe we've got the toughest judges in the state, that they just don't mess around and they're putting more people in prison and putting them in there for longer periods of time. Or well, there's a second possibility as well, and that's that this is a very dark community in which there's a lot of crime that many of us aren't seeing that's going on in the background. But the beauty of our community is deceiving, and this community desperately needs Jesus Christ. And Jesus has called us to be that light within this community. He's called us to, to be the ones who are, are reaching out. But it's important to remember it's not enough to win people to Christ. We must also disciple them and teach God's word to them. We try to do that in a variety of ways here at, at Shoreline. One of the things that we do is on Tuesday nights, both Chad and I have, have men's groups in which we bring them in and we disciple them. I take the men through disciplines of a God and then, and then, and then just turn over to Chad who's taken them through other discipleship courses as well. We've got one of the wives of our elders here that's been working with ladies one-on-one. -on -one, and she's been out here discipling and, and ministering. I, I am so proud of my daughter Jessie and of, of Kelly Olin with what they're doing with the teenage girls because within the frontline youth ministry, do you realize between those two girls alone, they are discipling four girls each one-on-one, -on -one, uh, sometimes for an hour at a time. One of them, even in, in fact, two of them, even in Puerto Rico now, who used to attend here. And they continue on and they do that discipleship. Now, for the other kids, for the serious students, on Tuesday nights, they've been doing it at home, something called Solid Ground. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at home, we had something canceled here, I wasn't able to, to, to go, and so I was there, and I could hear what was going on. Those kids are on fire for Jesus. And they're the ones that want to ready for the topic here? Christian apologetics. Why would they want to be disciples in apologetics? <laughs> Why wouldn't they? You look at what the teachers are teaching today as they get prepared to go into college. How would they defend their faith? How would they be able to stand there and answer some of the charges, the false charges that are being brought against Christians by the teachers that they're going to be working with and the other people in that sphere of influence? On top of that, these girls have been taking their own money out of their pockets and buying the girls they're discipling beautiful study Bibles to give to them as a gift. It's so exciting to, to see all of that going on. But then there's another way that we're trying to disciple here at Shoreline as well, and that's through Right Now Media. Uh, how many of you have tried going into Right Now Media and check that out? There are over 10,000 Bible studies that you can go into and sharpen yourself up, disciple yourself up at your own time. Top quality teachers out there. The church covers the cost. It's like purchasing cable TV. And then as a result of that, the entire church body is to use it any time, 24 hours a day. All of these teachers out there, it's absolutely incredible. You can bring them in your home, programming for children. We're trying to disciple and build, build up the body of Christ so that all of us can go out there and minister and make disciples. Well, you may feel that you're not qualified, but the fact is, is that Jesus has called each and every one of us to disciple, whether that's for our children, our grandchildren, or whoever it might be. Well, everybody wants their life to count for something. And I've got to ask you, what are you making your life count for? Mark Tatedale writes this. He says, 300 million years from now, what will be the only thing that will matter? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we just, we just look at the, the here and the now. But 300 million years from now, what will be the only thing that matters? Will it matter how much money you make? Will it matter what kind of car you drove? Will it matter who won the NCC, NCAA football game, or I could say the Oregon Duck game last night? <laughs> hey, they won, right? I watched the first half, and I thought, that's a blowout, I'm out of here. So I missed something? <laughs> 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 well, it, will it matter who won the NCAA football and, and basketball titles this year? Will it matter who you took to the homecoming dance? 300 million years from now, the only thing that will matter is who is in heaven and who is in hell. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. It is, if it is of the utmost importance for Jesus to reach the lost, shouldn't it be a major priority for you? The real question then is, what are you doing of significance today that will matter 300 million plus years from now? 
Well, perhaps one of the reasons that you don't reach out to other people is because of the fear of rejection. And maybe you have had family members or coworkers, and you don't want to face the consequences that they, they do reject you because of your faith. But I like to liken it like this. I want you to imagine that for some reason or another, you ended up getting home at 3 o'clock in the morning. And as you got home at 3 o'clock in the morning, all the neighbors are sound asleep. But you look at one of the houses, it's on fire. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. What are you going to do? You know, if I go over and start knocking on that door, they're going to be mad at me. I don't want to rattle them up. I, I don't want to let them know that they're in danger. They, they might get upset at me. I, I think I'm just going to mind my own business. I'm going to go home, and I'm not even going to pay attention. Let me ask you this. What would be more loving? Would it be more loving not to wake them up from their sleep or to get over there and start banging on that door and, if necessary, kick the door to tell them that their house is on fire so that they can get out of there and not burn? I think so often that we're so concerned about offending somebody that we won't say anything. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we'll just stand back and we'll watch them head to an eternity apart from Christ, realizing fully what the consequences are. But we won't say a thing to them. Well, in his book, uh, One Thing That You Can't Do in Heaven, and by the way, one thing that you can't do in heaven is evangelize, because by that time, we're going to be done evangelizing. Right now, we can evangelize. But one thing you can do in heaven, Mark Hagel shares the following poem. My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you day by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My knowledge was then was very dim. You could have left me safe. You could have led me safe to him. Though we lived together here on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But I learn now that it's too late and you could have kept me from this faith. We walked by day and talked by night and yet you showed me not boy. You let me live and love and die. You knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life and trusted you through joy and strife. And yet on coming to this dreadful end, I cannot now call you friend. Wow. I read that poem and I thought, how many people do we have the opportunity to reach out with the love of Christ? Oh, they can, they can reach out. But our responsibility from Jesus is to go. Our responsibility from Jesus is to make disciples. It's in the imperative. That means it's a command. And when we see the word go, it's in the present participle, which means that the word we should already be going as believers. When you see the word baptize, that word really is baptize as you are baptized. As you see the word teach, that word is not just teach, but it's, it's teaching, that you are teaching. It's, it's taken for granted. They're, they're, they're action verbs that it's taken for granted. Well, as we finish this incredible gospel of Matthew, Jesus finishes with these words. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even the end. I want you to think about who's in your life that you can reach out to, that you can share the love of Christ with. Maybe going through a difficult time and you can take some cookies over to their house just to encourage them. Or, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the years is in difficult times, that's a wide open door to be able to go in and pray with somebody. Just ask them. Do you mind if I pray with you? And if somebody's going through a crisis, nine times out of ten, they'll say, please. And it gives you the opportunity to start spiritual things where you can begin to share. Everybody can make a disciple of somebody. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for this gospel of Matthew. Lord, so blessed to follow the life of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And now the challenge for each and every one of us to go and make disciples. 
Lord, it's a scary thing for us to go out, and I know many of us here don't feel qualified to do that, but you have promised that if we go, that you will be with us, that you will empower us to be able to do that. And so I pray that today would be the first day of the rest of our lives for, for many people here, as we commit to doing what we can to reach people with, with your gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never received Christ as Lord and Savior, they're in that burning house that we talked about with a faith that's, that's not good. Lord, I pray that not another day would go by without repentance and without coming to Christ, that, that, that you would be received as Savior and Lord. And Lord, if there's someone who like that, I just pray that they would pray for like this. Lord, I have messed my life up so much. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. Help me be the kind of man, woman, boy, or girl that you desire for me. Lord, this day I surrender my life to you. 